Good morning. Uh, welcome to the 11th meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Um, item one on the agenda, we have a declaration of interest. Um, Bob Doris um, has moved on from uh, the Public Audit Committee and I'd just like to thank Bob for his uh, robust interventions and, uh, and, and work during his time on the committee. However, uh, we have a, a very effective replacement, a man I've known for many years, even before the creation of the Scottish Parliament, uh, Bruce Crawford, MSP. Bruce, uh, I know, will bring uh, another dimension to the, the work of the committee. So welcome, Bruce. And uh, can I invite you to declare any relevant interests? Uh, no relevant interests to declare. Thank you, Convener, for uh, asking me or, or saying such nice things at the beginning. Thank you. Beginning. Um, <laughs> item two. <laughs> Um, can we, uh, decisions in, in private, can we agree to take items five and six in private? Agreed. Right. Item three, uh, we have a section 23 report on accident and emergency, a performance update. Um, the committee will recall that we have previously taken uh, evidence from the Auditor General and Audit Scotland on accident and emergency. Uh, and this is, uh, is an interesting update. So. Um, the, the Auditor General is accompanied by Catherine Young and Tricia Meldrum. Can I invite the Auditor General to brief the committee? Thank you, Convener. The report that I'm bringing to the committee today, as you say, provides an update on how the NHS has been performing against the four-hour waiting time standard in accident, accident and emergency since our last report in 2010. A&E departments provide a really important service for patients with serious injuries or illness, and it's important that patients are seen quickly. The government has a standard that 98% of A&E patients should be treated and discharged or admitted within four hours of arriving. In April 2013, it also introduced an interim target of 95%, which it expects NHS boards to achieve for the year ending this September 2014. As the committee is aware from my recent report on NHS final financial management, the NHS in Scotland is not currently meeting the four-hour waiting time standard for A&E. Performance against the target has deteriorated since 2010, although it improved during 2013. There is significant variation in performance across A&E departments, with 14 of the 31 A&E departments meeting the 95% interim target in December 2013. It's important to say that there's no simple explanation for why more patients are now waiting over four hours. A&E departments are part of a much bigger health and social care system, and pressures across the system can mean that patients can be delayed in A&E. For example, many patients need to be admitted to hospital, and delays can be down to a hospital bed not being available right at the time that it's needed. This may be because another patient is waiting to be discharged from hospital later in the day and so is still occupying the bed that the new patient will require. We know that more patients are now being admitted to hospital from A&E and there are more delays in A&E because patients are waiting for a hospital bed to become available. There's also some evidence to suggest that patients attending A&E now have more serious health problems than they have done in the past. Across Scotland, just over a quarter of A&E patients were admitted to hospital in 2012-13. Staffing challenges can also affect how long patients wait. A&E departments obviously need the right number and mix of staff, and they need those staff to be available when they're required. Since our last report, the number of A&E consultants has increased by 63%, and there are now around 154 whole-time equivalent consultant posts. But there are still pressures around medical staffing, including a reduction in some other grades of staff, difficulties in filling vacancies, and lower numbers of staff available at weekends and evenings. In response to the deteriorating performance, the Scottish Government launched the National Unscheduled Care Action Plan in February 2013. One of the aims of the plan is to reduce A&E waiting times, and the Scottish Government and NHS boards are taking steps to address some of the causes of delays. The initial work they've done has focused on making improvements in acute hospitals, and the next stage is expected to look at the wider health and social care system. It will take time to see the impact of these actions, but we know that there was some improvement in A&E waiting times during 2013. My report makes a number of recommendations for the Scottish <coughs> Government. These are mostly about sharing good practice on initiatives that can help improve A&E department's performance and improve waiting times for patients. 
convener, as always, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you for that, Auditor General. Uh, I know what you say that there's been some improvement uh, in, in 2013, but it, but it is worrying that since you last looked at it, we have seen a deterioration despite um, the investment and despite the commitment uh, to improve matters. And it's clearly a matter of concern for the public. The targets are set for good reason. The politicians and the officials who set the targets clearly believe that targets are realistic. They clearly believe that there is a purpose for setting those targets. And therefore, not to meet the targets is of great concern. Now, I know what you say about some improvement uh, more recently, but uh, if I could maybe raise uh, an issue that's, uh, that's relevant to me locally. The Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley in the year 2013-14 for November and December, um, the figures in I Exhibit 7 actually dipped below 90%. And I suppose maybe from a, a West of Scotland perspective, what, what is more worrying is if you look at the Western Infirmary, um, consistently the figures are below 90%. So while you may have um, hospitals like, you know, the Gilbert Bart, or sorry, the Gilbert Bain Hospital, which is uh, again consistently doing well, and the, the Royal Hospital for Sick, Ch Sick Children in Edinburgh. Um, has a consistently uh, good performance. There are others that are consistently poor. Um, have you looked at the specific reasons, for example, why the RAH in Paisley and why the Western Infirmary um, are showing a, a, a dip in performance? Um, it's important to say that this report is a performance update rather than the full audit that we carried out in 2010. So to a great extent, we've relied on the um, nationally available data and investigated that as far as we can to explore um, what's associated with better performance or with worse performance. You're absolutely right to say that A&E waiting times are important, both to all of us as patients and, and family members, um, in that we want to be seen and treated as quickly as possible, and also because there's some evidence that longer delays um, can compromise clinical uh, effectiveness and the quality of care. So this matters, and that's why the government has set the targets that it has. It's also important, I think, for me to keep this in proportion, that as at December, 93.5% of patients across Scotland were being seen within four hours. But equally, there's huge variation across A&E departments, as you've highlighted in looking at um, Exhibit 7 on page 16 of the report. Um, I think one of the most important things that we're trying to draw out in the report is the need for individual A&E departments to really understand the factors that are leading to delays for them, whether it's availability of beds, availability of clinical staff, availability of alternatives at the right time, and using that to um, put in place solutions for their particular problems. You'll notice, for example, that um, big... Uh, uh, complex specialist hospitals like Nine Wells have got very good performance and we've got a case study in the report that highlights a range of things they've done to tackle that. Um, my recommendations in the report are really um, recommending that the government and health boards should be taking a very similar tailored approach to understand what's causing the bottlenecks in their system and to look beyond A&E for the solutions to that. Have you identified problems either with an investment or ineffective management has been issues and again forgive me for being parochial but just sticking with Greater Glasgow and, and Clyde um, the you know, in, in December of the 2013-14 period Glasgow Royal Infirmary uh, below 90% Inverclyde was above it REH and Paisley below Royal Hospital for Sick Children was above as was the Southern General but the Victoria and the Western Infirmary were both below 90%. What would cause that, that type of cluster? Um, 
As we say in the report, the things that affect a and &E performance really are um, complex and interrelated. Um, first of all, the rate of attendance at A&E is affected by deprivation in the local area and by the distance um, from where people live to the A&E department, so that's a starting point. Interestingly, we know that, that total A&E attendances have dropped very slightly since our last report. There's been a rise in minor injury units, but A&E &E attendances have gone down. But we have seen both an increase in the number of older people attending A&E and um, an increase in the number of people admitted from A&E, suggesting that, that um, people are uh, sicker than they previously were, more seriously in need of attention. And then, as you touched on in your question, there are real differences in the way that um, A&E departments are managed as part of the wider system. So in Tayside, they've worked very hard to make sure they've got um, appropriate specialist medical staff available, not just during the working day, but in evenings at weekends. As soon as it looks likely that a patient may need to be admitted, they start the process of identifying a bed so there isn't a wait for that. Um, they work very hard at making sure GPs can refer directly to wards rather than through a and &E, and they signpost alternatives to accident and emergency departments. So that whole system of making it work seems to be very effective in Tayside, and we think there's scope for other a and &E departments to be doing more of that sort of approach. Would you have then expected, you know, after the recommendations that you've made with increased investment, the fact that areas like Tayside uh, can achieve it, that you should, be, you should be seeing that across Scotland? It's certainly the case that since the government's national and scheduled care action plan was introduced a year ago in February, we've seen an improvement, as we say in the report. Um, and we think there's, there's scope for that improvement to be more consistent um, right across Scotland. Equally, we do know that A&E departments can be an important indicator of pressure on the system as a whole. We know there are financial pressures. We know the population's ageing. We know all of the, the pressures that we've discussed in this committee before continue, which is why we think focusing on this specific indicator isn't an end in itself, but is an opportunity to look at the way the system as a whole works. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ken McIntosh. Uh, thanks, Convener. And uh, thank you, uh, the report, uh, Auditor General. The, uh, as well as the uh, missing the four hour uh, target, I have to say I was slightly worried um, by the number of other um, uh, statistics that emerge in your in report, in particular on, on page 18, paragraphs 19, 20, and 21. You've suggested that. I've suggested you've, you've stated quite clearly that the, uh, the number of patients who waited longer than 12 hours has also increased. The median wait for patients has increased. So that means that it's, it's not just people not meeting four hours. The, the, the average experience for patients is getting worse. Uh, and uh, very worryingly, a huge number, 70,000 patients, are now being seen in the last 10 minutes. This doesn't paint a very good picture at all, does it? Um, I think if you look at Exhibit 8, you can see very clearly that sense of, of the pressure on A&E departments building up, increasing since our last report in 2010. Um, and um, all of that's important because in spite of all of the efforts that the government and NHS boards are, are making to uh, meet the target of 95% of people being seen and either treated or discharged within four hours, those pressures are still there. Um, that's not going to change. We know that the population is ageing, that older people are more likely to attend A&E and more likely to need to be admitted, that more people have got complex health problems. All of that's part of what's going on. And it's why we think A&E departments need to be seen within the context of the whole health and social care system locally so that those pressures can be properly managed. But they're real, no question about it. But you'd, you'd agree that the, the, it's not just about this one target of four hours. The fact is that the overall experience seems to be um, that there is, a, there is a problem across the whole area of A&E here. What we say in the report is that this is an indicator of real pressure in A&E and across the health and social care system. The fact that the median weight has increased isn't necessarily a bad thing in itself, although it's obviously bad for the people who might have been seen in an hour previously and are now waiting two or three hours. It may mean that there's more appropriate triaging and people are being, um, their, their needs are being more tailored in the care that they're getting. But it certainly is an indicator that there's pressure in the system and that we believe a number of boards will find it hard to meet the 95% target by September of this year. Is that the average experience? When you talk about the median, are, how, how long are patients waiting now compared to what they, they were waiting? 
Um, we report in paragraph 20, as you highlighted, um, that the median has increased from 99 minutes in 2008-9 to 126 minutes in 2012-13. I think that we don't know what that figure is for December 2013 because it's not reported nationally. Um, so we've used the most uh, up-to-date available data that is available nationally. I'd expect there to have been a slight improvement by December 2013, as we've seen across the rest of the um, A&E performance, but we don't know that yet. There's a particularly worrying comment about the, uh, the uh, prospects or the, the uh, treatment given to those seen in the last 10 minutes. Uh, you, you suggest that national data show that patients who are admitted just before the end of the four-hour period are likely to spend longer in hospital. Um, that was in paragraph 33. Yeah, and and, and what, what you're saying is that 11% of all admissions to hospital took place within the last 10 minutes of the four-hour period, and, and this figure has gone up hugely. Catherine may want to add to what I say in a moment. Um, I think, first of all, um, we would all recognise that if you set a four-hour target, there will be particular attention on patients who are coming towards that four-hour waiting period. It's one of the inevitable side effects of setting targets. We can't tell from the data that's available whether patients are being admitted inappropriately in that last 10-minute period to avoid breaching the four hours. But we did, as we say in the report, test that through proxy by looking at how long those patients were staying in hospital. Our hypothesis was that if they were being admitted inappropriately, they would have shorter lengths of stay. They'd be in for a short period and then discharged. In fact, we found the opposite. We found patients admitted in that last 10 minutes were likely to have longer lengths of stay. Um, and therefore, we didn't conclude that it was likely they were being admit admitted inappropriately. We do say, though, that it probably does highlight real pressures with the patient flow through the system. Catherine, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, just to add, the decision to admit may well have been made earlier in that four hours, but um, as, as um, the Auditor General has already mentioned, um, that whole process, the, the, the patient flow and identifying that bed early on in the process, in some cases, as you can see in Exhibit 14, doesn't happen till late on um, in, in that process for um, some departments, and that's why we've made a recommendation around the Scottish Government sharing good practice um, about discharge processes to try, to try and speed up that or start that process earlier um, for, for a &E patients. And I, I mean, for a number of reasons, it's very worrying. Clearly, <coughs> if the targets are being set, being modified and still not being met, that's worrying. If the targets are distorting care, then that's also worrying. So, I mean, it's worrying from both aspects, is it not? We're not concluding that they're distorting care, um, and we did test that, as I, I said in my answer to your earlier question. Um, we are recognising, um, first of all, that setting targets and standards can be a good way of focusing managers and clinic clinicians' attention on things that matter to patients but they tend to have a distorting effect in terms of um, people seeking to hit the target rather than to necessarily um, run in a more natural flow of, of the way patients would be um, worked. I think what we are seeing and what we say in the report is that there are indications of pressure in the system. Um, 14 of the 31 A&E departments met the four-hour target in December of last year, and we think that many boards will struggle to hit the um, target date by September of this year for the new target. Um, you uh, said in the, um, no, not, you didn't suggest, but the, uh, you, you've highlighted the, the availability of beds as one of the, uh, the reasons uh, that might be behind this overall. Uh, I believe that the, the statistics from February this year show that there were 135,000 beds lost due to delayed discharge. There's also, I believe, more than 1,500 beds physically been lost over the last seven years in Scottish hospitals. The number of beds available in hospitals generally is down by 1,500 or possibly more. Um, would you point to either of those factors? Which, which of those factors would be more important? Um, we talk about the issue of bed numbers and bed occupancy in paragraph 40, and you're right, the overall number of acute beds has reduced since our last report, um, we think by 7%, um, from 17,374 in 2008 9 to 16,230 in 2012 13. 
Most of those beds are in acute surgery, reflecting the fact that more surgery is being done on a day case basis um, rather than patients who had previously have been admitted at least overnight and possibly for longer. And we've reported on that to this committee before. Um, what's interesting is that the average occupancy rate of acute hospital beds has increased over the same period, and particularly in acute medicine, which is often where patients admitted through A&E need to, to find a bed. Um, I think in acute medicine, the average occupancy rate um, in 2012-13 was 85%. Now, 85% um, as an average can conceal some periods of very high occupancy, and there is some evidence, although it's not conclusive, that above 85%, um, clinical safety um, can become more difficult. Um, and that's why we think the uh, focus on uh, bed occupancy is so important here. It makes it easier to find a bed if bed occupancy is a bit lower. Um, and I think when we look at the correlation between bed occupancy and performance, there's a clear relationship. Catherine, do you want to comment on the relationship there? Um, so in paragraph 41, we talk about um, we ran a correlation between um, higher bed occupancy um, and performance against the target. And we just draw on the range there between Tayside, where the occupancy was um, 79, almost 80%. Um, um, where um, it was much higher in Fourth Valley. In Fourth Valley, they have weaker performance against the, the target um, compared with um, NHS Fourth Valley. But it's also about the use of those beds, and again, we highlight that in the good practice um, for Tayside. It's again identifying early on in the, in, in the process, um, identifying having good discharge processes in place. So not just about the numbers, but about how the beds are used and, and the timing and the availability of the beds. Um, when we discussed in December in your report, we discussed the fact that uh, no health board had made the waiting time target either. Um, there was a lot of concern expressed by the committee that patients, despite the so-called patient guarantee, patients had no recourse whatsoever. Do patients have any recourse in this case for not meeting the four-hour target? I think the A&E waiting time target isn't enshrined in statute in the way the treatment time guarantee is. Um, so there's no recourse other than through the normal complaints procedures, um, which would be taken forward by each health board individually. Thank you. Just before I bring Willie Coffey in, can I ask something relating to what Ken McIntosh just said? Um, on Exhibit 14, you, um, you show the admissions... Uh, to A and E in the last ten minutes, have you run the figures to show what the targets would have been like um, had those patients not been seen within the last ten minutes? Like how bad or how much worse would the figures have been if those patients hadn't been seen in the last ten minutes? No, we haven't done that um, the, be, because those patients were admitted, and we didn't find any evidence to suggest that people were being admitted inappropriately. Did you look at all to see whether um, the, the, the patient experience was, was being rushed or was less thorough than those seen at other times in that four-hour period? In other words, is there, any, is there anything to suggest that um, hospitals are suddenly rushing people uh, through A&E in the last 10 minutes in order to make sure that targets are met? No, um, unlike in 2010 when we did interview patients directly um, and use focus groups to explore their um, experience, in this update we've really just used the nationally available data. We are planning some work um, on unscheduled care more generally and as part of that we will want to talk to patients again. But all, all we've used in this report is the performance data that's available to us. That, that, that would be useful if you yeah. could do that at some point in the future because mm -hmm. it would be a concern if uh, patients were just suddenly being wheeled into accident and emergency in order to make sure that bureaucratic targets were being met. Um, okay, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, good morning, Auditor General. Um, could I look at, in a wee bit more detail about the numbers involved here? I mean, wh while it's quite correct for the committee to examine performance in relation to the target, I think it's appropriate for the committee to acknowledge the good performance that's actually taking place. And I think you mentioned it in your remarks there. I mean, 93.5% is pretty good performance, I would suggest. The numbers that are reflected by that, there's 1,600,000 presentations to A&E. And the, the amount that are met in terms of the target is 1.5 million of that. I would suggest to committee members that that's not bad considering the, the pressures that are brought to bear on the NHS and all the, 
the strains that you've mentioned your, yourself, Auditor General. That's actually pretty good. And in terms of comparable stats between, for example, Scotland and Wales, I mean, Wales is currently sitting about 87.7% and meet, meeting this target. So in Scotland, it's, it's significantly higher, although we want to achieve the target that's been set. But, Auditor General, could, could you tell me, like, how, how far short are we of actually meeting the target in terms of the number of patients that, that present themselves to A&E and so forth? You're right, it is important to um, keep this in proportion and often um, straightforward numbers can be uh, easier to, to get a grip on than percentages. If I focus on December 2013, which is the latest figures available and the point at which it was possible to see an improvement from the low point in January 2013, um, we say in the report that 8,300 patients across Scotland waited for more than four hours and 118,000 waited for less than four hours. So 118,000 to 8,300, um, a good performance for those 118,000, but clearly not as good as any of us would hope for the, the people, the 8,500 people with the longer wait. Um, in terms of what 95% would look like, um, which is the interim target that government set for um, uh, September this year, um, I think you'd expect that 8,300 to come down slightly to somewhere nearer 7,500, and we can give you the exact figures separately if that would help. The 98% standard, of course, which is still in existence from the government, would require a further shift again. What we focused on particularly in this report, though, is the variation across Scotland, that 14 of the 31 A&E departments reached the target in 2012-13, um, 17 of them didn't. And as you can see from um, Exhibit uh, 7 on pages 16 and 17, there is still quite significant variation between A&E departments in the extent to which they're meeting the 98% um, target, those shown in green, meeting the 95% target, those shown in amber, and um, missing both of the targets, those shown in red. And it's that variation that we think it should really be the focus of attention now. But, you know, compared to the, the, the total number of presentations that we're getting in Scotland in a given year at 1.6 million, I mean, the numbers that we need to achieve throughout the the health boards and hospitals and so on, to reach that 95, it's not significantly high compared to the number of people that are presenting to us. I mean, it's not, it's not a huge number, as I understand it, to allow us to get to that target. I think I'm at the limit of my ability to do, to do mental arithmetic in front of the committee. Um, so we'll give you the figures separately, if we may, Mr Coffey. Um, and I think I can only agree with you that 93.5% is by no means a bad performance. It's higher than it has been historically and higher than in some other parts of the UK. But equally, for each of those 8,300 patients who are waiting longer than four hours, it's not ideal, both in terms of their experience and potentially the quality and clinical effectiveness of their care. So I think we're all interested in pushing it up to the government's target and then onto the standard in due course and recognising that there are real challenges in doing that. And, and, and looking at recommendations to how to, to improve this, um, I noted in the report that you'd said that discharges from hospitals tend not to occur tend not to occur over the weekend, but that presentations to A and E tend to go up on Mondays and Tuesdays, which was a surprise to me actually. So I mean it seems kind of obvious to me that there's an opportunity there <laughs> to make a significant improvement by doing something fairly simple and that is to try to manage the discharge process at an earlier part of the, of the week so that beds become available at the expected point when people present to, to A and E. Is that is that something that you made clear in the report. I couldn't quite see that as one of your recommendations. I think it is, it is um, it one of our recommendations and one of the things we focus on in terms of bed availability, not just days of the week, but time of day. Very often patients who are being discharged leave hospital in the afternoon, which means that if I rock up at the A&E department at 9 o'clock in the morning and the decision is taken to admit me, the bed may not be available until 2 o'clock, which is more than four hours before we start. Places like Nine Wells and Perth Royal Infirmary are very good at monitoring the time of day at which patients are discharged, um, at doing discharge planning better and managing the admissions process better. So all of that means the system comes together in a way which lets them achieve very strong performance consistently in ways that other boards and other A&E departments are still struggling to do. I think what I'd say is that it's simple, but it's not easy. Yep. 
I think I think there's an opportunity there to, to do something to really make a, an improvement here. My last point to convener was in that point about the median. You know, the median is, is, is the most frequently occurring um, time. It's not the average, it's the most frequently occurring. And, and according to your report, the median waiting time is two hours, uh, six minutes. And I recognise that that has gone up. But it's two hours, six minutes, which is well within the target time of four hours. So I think we have to put that in, in context that while it has gone up, the median waiting time for patients in Scotland present to any is two hours, six minutes, which is well within the four hours. And would, would you recognise that? Absolutely. One of the purposes of this report and, our, and all our reports is to try and be as transparent and objective as we can about that performance data. Um, it's very clear that the median is two hours and six minutes, well below the four hours. It's also true that it has crept up. And I think our concern is that that's just a sign of growing pressure in the system. And we can see that in some of the A&E departments very clearly. Uh, Vina, can I just go back to Ken McIntosh's point about the 11% of all admissions to hospital from A&E departments took place within the last 10 minutes in Paris 32 and, and 33. Uh, Auditor General, I think you said that you didn't in this particular exercise um, assess directly from patients why that was the case, but do you, can you shed any line on the underlying reasons why, it's, why that figure is as high as, uh, as you found in your, in your report? Um, our hypothesis is um, that it's uh, boards doing what they've been asked to do, which is to make sure that as many patients as possible have been seen and either admitted or discharged within four hours. Um, as Mr Coffey has said, the median time is two hours, six minutes, so we know that for most patients the process is starting well and many can be um, discharged very quickly once they've been either treated or referred to a more appropriate place. For those who can't, we know there can be delays in finding a bed, in getting a clinical assessment carried out, in um, identifying a specialist to carry out an assessment where that's needed. Um, and our experience from earlier work is that A&E departments will work very hard to make sure that is happening within four hours. But if the system's under pressure, it may well be happening quite close to four hours, and there will be an entirely understandable focus on the patients who are approaching four hours to get them seen, treated, admitted as quickly as possible. Trisha, I think, would like to add to that. And just if you look at Exhibit 14, it's just to um, raise the point again, we, we talked about nine wells and nine wells doing more to identify patients who need a bed early in the process and start looking to identify a bed for patients early in the process. And again, you see that nine wells being very low down in that table in terms of the percentage of patients admitted in the last 10 minutes. So Again, they've put in place a number of things that mean that they are, they are able to, to be admitting patients a bit earlier. I mean, I could just say in passing, four hours is a really long time. You know, just uh, from personal experience and someone in my family, can I say four hours? I mean, it doesn't matter, it's a long time to be hanging around, sitting, waiting, waiting, waiting. But can I just go back to this, um, you know, if the target was three hours, presumably also there would be a rush for the last ten minutes. It doesn't, in some ways, it doesn't matter when the target is. The, the system is such that once a target is set, there will be an enormous amount of pressure um, on health professionals to move people out of the waiting room, as it were, and through and into the system so they can tick the box. Is that, is that the case? I think that's right. I think it's clear that targets can be a very good device for focusing any service provider on the, the thing that is being measured and the thing that's been prioritised. And as you say, four hours is a long time. It's not an unreasonable target or standard to be setting. But if you set it, then there, there will be a real focus on getting as many of the patients who are approaching four hours as possible, either discharged or, in this case, admitted before they hit the four-hour um, deadline. No, that's fair. And so on Willie Coffey's fair point about the median time, why do we have four hours? Why should we put up with four hours as the, as the, 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 the period of time that we should expect people to have to wait and still be within a notional target set by, um, you know, set by the government of the day, in that sense, or set by the NHS? When, if the median's two hours, why don't we get the, the target down to whatever, I forget Willie Coffey's figure, but say two hours, 16 minutes, why don't we make it two and a half hours? There's a number of strands to the answer there, one of which is that that's a question for government rather than for us who's setting the target. Equally, I'd say any average tends to conceal a wide range of performance. So the fact that the median is two hours, six minutes, doesn't mean that you can make the target two and a half and have a chance of, of hitting it. Um, equally, I think the College of Emergency Medicine um, have cited evidence which says that after four hours, um, there is a risk of both quality and clinical effectiveness being compromised. So it, as, my, as we understand, 
find it, there is some basis in the clinical evidence for four hours, even though it can feel like a very long time to be waiting um, to be treated or discharged in an AA department on a busy Saturday night. Okay. And just on finally on this particular point, um, is, it your, um, is it your desire to actually, from Audit Scotland's point of view, to do some more work on this um, in relation to actually understanding from patients and I guess also from health professionals why, uh, why the figure would be 11% of all admissions in the last 10 minutes? Yes, um, we are um, carrying out a wider piece of work on the unscheduled care overall, not just here. Um, Catherine or Tricia may want to tell you a bit about what our thinking is on involving patients in that. We're um, planning to do some work looking at, um, as the Auditor General said, broader unscheduled care, so not just emergency departments, but overall emergency and urgent care. Um, looking at primary care as well, GP out of our services, NHS 24 ambulance services. So yes, we would definitely want to be doing some work. Uh, I'm really pleased you're doing that. But is, is the NHS doing that too? I mean, it shouldn't just be Audit Scotland having to do this kind of work. I mean, I'm assuming that the NHS themselves, health board chairman, the, the local boards, then you know, cl clinical professionals who are paid a lot of money at the top of these organisations should be driving at this kind of stuff, shouldn't they? Each of the 14 health boards, territorial health boards, has produced and submitted to government um, a local unscheduled care action plan, which we've reviewed as part of this work. Um, we think most of them are looking at the wider um, system of care and are looking at patients' experience, but it's too soon for us yet to see the impact of those. Um, and as we say, the variation is a big part of the issue. And, and it would be fair to say also, as you say in 32, that some are really good at this. The Royal Aberdeen Children's Hospital are are excellent at this, whereas the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh that seems to pop up nearly every report you produce for us on the NHS is not good. So presumably that's where the focus should be, on those who are not delivering. But that's very much the point we're making here, that 14 out of the 31 um, a &E departments are hitting the target, 17 aren't, and it, 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 our evidence suggests that you need a tailored solution to the particular factors in your A&E department. And you Thank you. Can I just ask you very other brief questions, convener? The second was on, you mentioned in your opening remarks, um, Auditor General, that despite increasing the number of consultants available across NHS, which obviously would be a good thing and welcome, um, the pressures have increased. Um, why is that? I mean, we are taking on more professionals at consultant level, to presumably to... Uh, to target particular problems, and yet, the pro and yet these figures that you presented to us today are worse. Why would that be? Exhibit 21 on page 34 tries to summarise that. Um, and you're right, we've seen something like a 63% increase in the number of consultants in post, whole time equivalent, which is a good thing because that senior decision making seems to make a real difference. Um, we have seen a reduction in the number of doctors in training working in A&E, partly because of changes to the way doctors are trained in general, which is aiming to give them more of a generalist and less of a specialist training so that they're better able to meet the needs of an ageing population. And some A&E departments clearly have difficulty in filling vacancies. They, they can be very pressured posts. Um, there are all sorts of difficulties in recruiting and retaining staff. The other bit of that, though, I think, is about making sure that people are there at the right time, um, making sure that it's not just Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 staffing, but that specialists are available in the evening, at weekends, at peak times. And again, we're going to sound like cheerleaders for Tayside, but at Nine Wells, they do that very well. They make sure they've got specialist staffing there till midnight, um, some cover in the quiet period after midnight, and really matter it to when they know patients are arriving. So it's not just about the numbers, it's about how people are used as well. I think that's very fair. And the final one, I just wanted to understand the point you made right at the, in the answer to your question, uh, your, to, to the question from the convener about the targets. Um, we have a 95% target, which is, as it were, an interim target, or I forget now exactly how you described it, and then as a standard target, 98%. Well, if we're not hitting 95, the 98 is neither here nor there, is it? The I, mean, uh, I mean, this is where I just get into this. Targets, things are irrelevant to the experience of real patients and real people. The 98% to be seen within um, four hours it has been the government standard for a while, um, and it's what they're aiming towards. When it became clear during 2012-13 that there were real pressures and that performance was deteriorating, they introduced a 95% target with the aim that that would be hit by September of this year um, as a, an interim step on the way to 98%. As we say in the report, some A&E departments are already hitting that. Some, some A&E departments will struggle to do so, and it's why we're focusing on the system as a whole. Will we know in September as to whether that 95% target has been hit across the health service? The team will keep me straight about when the data is available, Catherine. It's by the year ending September 2014, so we will know by then. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ken first wants to come back in and the earlier point, and then Bruce Crawford. It was just to clarify, the uh, in response to Tavis Scott's question, you pointed out that there is a, a, a tendency um, for a last-minute surge of admissions nearing the end of a target. 
uh, sort of the four-hour target produces a surge. But the point of this report today's work, which I thought you were highlighting, is that this surge has dramatically increased. In other words, the, the, it used to be 45,000. There was a little peak before, but the figure's gone up from 45,000 patients admitted in the last 10 minutes to 70,000 patients. And so, in other words, that's, that's a huge surge. That's not simply, you know, caused by a four-hour target because that four-hour target was always there. This is a huge increase at the end. I think the point we're making throughout this report is that in spite of great efforts on behalf of people across the NHS and especially people working in A&E departments, it is very tough to meet the four-hour target or standard which has been set um, and that that is uh, to a great extent for reasons outside the control of A&E departments themselves. Um, it's why we think that really understanding the, the problems in each A&E department and tailoring the solutions around the availability of beds, the availability of specialists, signposting people to alternatives is so important. That pressure is, is clearly there, even though a great deal of effort is going into making sure that as many patients as possible are treated within four hours. Thank you, Convener. Um, thank you very much, Honourable General, for your very helpful report, because actually it's helped us begin to have a, a much clearer understanding of what's going on, <coughs> although I accept there's much work still to be done, obviously. Uh, on that one, just on the issue that both Tabish and Ken were dealing with just at the end there. I think it was Catherine you began to explain to us about <clears throat> while people might be finding it, might be finding a bed in the last 10 minutes, that's not the, the, the beginning of their journey because their journey in terms of their e &E experience starts a lot earlier and actually their diagnosis, the process of, of finding out what's wrong with them um, you know, discovering what the issue is coming to a conclusion is ongoing through that four hours and it's, it might only just be the bed being found at the end. Do you want to just expand a bit more on that, please? Um, there is some evidence since our last report that, the, um, as the Auditor General has, has mentioned, that um, A&E departments are seeing more serious cases. Um, we found in 2012-13 that 50% of patients were categorised as flow ones, which I think in one of our exhibits we show that's minor um, injury illness. Um, compared with 55 in 2008-9. Um, so that would indicate that more serious cases are being seen. That combined with more patients being admitted from A&E um, into um, hospital links this, you know, this idea of complexity of care. So again, when you look at the, um, you know, it, by 10 minute intervals, more sick patients will need more, t more tests done, more blood work done. So that could also be a factor behind why, you know, why there is a longer wait for some of these patients. And, and on the, the, the issue of those who are more sick, it was, I was intrigued by Exhibit 9 um, when you compare it alongside Exhibit 5. Now, Exhibit 9 is about attendances at a and &E performance against the um, four-hour waiting standard, and the Exhibit 5 is issues to do with 999s. Is the issue I want to pick up on there um, in terms of Column 2? Because it seemed to me that there was a, quite a strong correlation between um, those, apart from nine wells, which seems to be the stick out in everything here, uh, in terms of good practice, between those hospitals which have got high 999 incidences and those who are performing less well in terms of A&E, which I think is the, it really was the point that Catherine was making, particularly if you look at if you, in Exhibit 9Z, um, which is the highest figure at 28.1, and that's the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, or you go to A, which is the University Hospital Air, it's got 18.4% um, of, of people who are admitted are coming from 999. Uh, Fourth Valley at G, which is another one in the bottom sort of quartile, at 29%. I mean, I could go on, there's a whole series of them at the bottom end of this, apart from Nine Wells in the Western, for some reason, who, where there's a it looks to me to be a correlation between that 999 issue and poorer performing a and E's in regard to the target. Would you like to reflect on that? Um, 
In terms of Exhibit 5, the referral sources, um, we do highlight later on footnote 10, um, there are some inconsistencies in how uh, any departments record self-referrals. So, for example, some record self-referrals who come in by ambulance, they, call, they record them as self-referrals, whereas others record them as 999s. So we didn't actually, when you ran the correlation with the 999 calls, there was no strong, strong correlation be between that and performance. <laughs> It's likely if, if departments recorded more consistently, there would be a link there. I think in our last a &E report, we did find um, patients who were referred by GPs or 999 calls were more likely to stay longer again, um, you know, therefore more complex cases. And that would obviously have an impact on performance dealing with, um, we did find a link between, you know, more complex cases and performance. So I think there are some issues around the consistency of those codes. So some may look, I think that's where nine, well, some may look like they're higher than others because they record the self-referrals um, as, as, sorry, the 999s as self-referrals. That says to me there needs to be a bit more work done in that area to examine what's going on. And there are other areas in your report which reflect that as well in, in terms of describing the complexity, the interrelated nature the problems of, in some places, the data is collected differently, uh, and there's a variety of practices. And I, when, uh, for instance, on, on page 20, um, at paragraph 22, where you see it's difficult to draw clear conclusions about the relative performance departments because of services provided vary across the country. On page 21, at paragraph 25, where you see, um, the methodology uh, in any &E departments used to define flows differs. Um, another example is on page 26, at paragraph 31, um, where it says that you, that again, the previous audit highlighted the opening hours and levels of staffing vary across the country up to date. National information about how hospitals use these units and how they operate is limited. Um, I, I, I could, there's a num right through the report, that's, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of that there. And I ask that because I think it becomes clear to me that to be able to get a full understanding um, of how, where we need to make the improvements that are going to be required in future years, um, we need a much more serious, and I'm not saying this is not a serious analysis, by the way, a, a more in-depth, serious analysis, investigation about, about where we can make these improvements through the system, where the interrelationships exist. So because if, if we look at this bit in isolation, we might actually end up disturbing another bit of the, the system and making it worse. So I make that point and that you, I know, are going to do further work, Auditor General, on that. Do you think it's appropriate that there should be not only, the, as Tavish raised, the health boards themselves and the government looking at this, but it might be useful for a parliamentary committee to, to undertake a, a thorough investigation about a and um, sitting in the whole of the, the exercise to make sure that we get a good examination of all this. It, it's certainly true that what we've done here is an update of a fuller report that we carried out in 2010 um, and we focused on the data which is available nationally about A&E. Um, we've used that as fully and as um, rigorously as we can. Um, Lucy Jones, who's not at this table, I think has correlated every possible set of factors with each other to see what might be um, interesting patterns and what might be explanations for them. Um, and we've pulled that out as far as we can. We've also tried to highlight, highlight where we think there are consistencies or where simply the data isn't available to, to draw conclusions. Um, and I think that's very much the intention of the work that the government has asked each of the 14 health boards to do as part of their local action plans in this area. We'll be looking at that as part of our um, next wider piece of work on unscheduled care as a whole. There may well be aspects of that that a parliamentary committee would want to explore. Um, I think that the trick is to use the data to ask the questions, and I think we've done that as well as can be done, and then to go and explore what the answers to those questions are locally, and therefore what that means in terms of solutions. Yeah, that's very helpful. Can you ask a couple of small questions, if that's okay? Um, in terms of the, your, your comprehensive report, and obviously over the past 12 months the, the waiting claims have shown an improvement and given that reduction over the, pa the past year if performance continues to follow that trend would you expect the numbers waiting over four hours to fall in the coming years? 
Um, what the conclusion we've reported here is that um, we think some health boards will find it difficult to meet the four-hour target by September this year. Given that challenge, I wouldn't like to call whether, whether the NHS as a whole will meet 95%, but I think it's very unlikely that all 31 A&E departments will hit four hours by this September. We all hope it will do, and there's lots of good work going on there, but there are a number of indicators sort of behind the four-hour figure in itself that suggest there is real pressure in, in many A&E departments. And f finally, convener, just in terms of bed numbers, I know that in terms of the, the stats that were um, talked about earlier, um, Am I right in saying that in, during 2012-13 there was actually there's been an increase over that year in bed numbers of 100, about 183? Um, I don't have the figures uh, available to confirm that just now. Um, I think what we are very clear on is that the reduction was an appropriate reduction that reflected a move to day surgery, um, but that there are signs of pressure around acute medicine beds uh, where the occupancy level across Scotland is at around 85%. So um, it's another one of those areas where a better understanding of what's happening would be very helpful, both at national level and, more importantly, in each of the 14 health boards. You got good look at that and let us know, though, did sure. you? Okay. Thank you, Convener. Hey, Mary Scanlon. Thank you. <coughs> Can I, I first ask a, a very general question, um, which is uh, I, I got from paragraph 3, and it refers back to your emergency department's report in uh, August 2010, which included Scottish Ambulance Service and NHS 24. You made some clear recommendations and, in your own words, setting out a clearer strategic direction for emergency care services, and you go on to say, since then, performance against the standard deteriorated. Um, your recommendations, guidance and strategic direction, uh, were these taken on board and, as a result, deteriorated? The, the um, figures deteriorate the standard, performance against the standard deteriorated, or were your recommendations ignored? Uh, some of them were accepted and implemented, um, some of them a little bit later. And I'll ask Catherine, if I may, just to highlight the, um, the, what actually happened there. Okay. Um, in, par in part three, we comment on um, progress um, in the recommendations we made in our last report. I think overall, through the work of this um, National and Treasure Care Action Plan, a lot of our recommendations are now being progressed. Um, as the Auditor General has already mentioned, there are, it's, it is quite complex. So some of the um, quick win solutions, I think we've, we've, we've kind of highlighted again in this report, um, the more the longer term strategic um, recommendations, I think we're now seeing some evidence of that um, with this new unscheduled care action plan. Um, in terms of staffing, um, benchmarking information, use of assessment units, those sorts of recommendations are now being um, Progressed um, and a lot more evidence of what's of, of the outcomes of those. Pres presumably, had all the recommendations been adhered to, we would be seeing an, a deterioration. We would be seeing uh, be greater progress. <coughs> Can I just move on a very uh, quick um, question? In your um, uh, comments at the beginning, Auditor General, you did say there were more uh, over 65s presenting to a and &E. we, we know have an ageing population. Uh, you've also mentioned a couple of times today that uh, there are more complex needs. Uh, we now have, uh, and it's really a supplementary to Ken McIntosh and um, Tavish Scott, we've got over 18% of people being seen in the last 10 minutes at Hare Myers and uh, the Royal in Edinburgh. If you take those three together, that, you know, in some hospitals, almost 20% are being seen in the last 10 minutes. Is it not, uh, and that in that last 10 minutes, they are more likely to be admitted to hospital and stay longer. Is it, c can you not conclude from the evidence that you've given today that the patients with the less complex needs are being seen quicker and that the target uh, could be distorting uh, or prioritising the, the target, those seen quicker, rather than clinical need. Are the targets distorting clinical need? Because it seems to me there is almost sufficient evidence in what you've said today that that's the case. 
We, we didn't find evidence of that, um, and we tested for it specifically um, in relation to the patients who were admitted in the last 10 minutes of the four-hour period. Um, we started with the assumption that if those patients were being admitted to avoid breaching four hours, they'd probably be discharged more quickly than other patients, and in fact we found that they were staying in hospital for longer than other patients. Um, clearly, um, A&E departments do need to manage the flow of patients who arrive at their front door to make sure that um, the most seriously ill or injured patients are getting priority and are receiving the, the range of assessment and treatment that they need. We didn't find any evidence that's not the case. What we did find, though, again, is another example in Tayside of the, um, the, the sort of reception process when somebody arrives, being very clear about whether somebody has got a relatively minor condition that um, may be able to get them treated and discharged without too much complexity of care, and those who are likely to need both more complex assessment and potentially an admission. And that made a real difference to their overall performance, but also to the quality of care that both of those groups of patients got. They described it as streaming. Now, from the data we can't can't tell how, how consistently that's happening across Scotland, but we didn't find evidence of gaming of the target, only of the fact that a target inevitably does have an impact on um, where the attention of the managers and clinicians tends to focus as you head towards four hours. I, th I think there's no doubt about it that Tayside is a model of best practice, which, to be fair, is not replicated in other 30 a &E units. I would like to go to Exhibit 5 that Bruce Crawford looked at. Um, and I, I actually find a bit of a difficulty because this time uh, you've looked at accident and emergency within a &E units. The last time, uh, I wasn't on the committee then, but I think you looked at uh, NHS 24, ambulance, etc. So I, I do find it difficult because we're looking at one part of quite a large model. And I think in your own words, it needs to be seen as an overall part of the health and social care system. But to me, Exhibit 5 was more than interesting. Uh, I think, for example, at the Belford and Fort William, 82% are self-referred, and zero from 999, and zero from GPs. When I dug slightly deeper into that, I discovered that uh, out of the 31 units, 19 had zero referrals from GPs. And I just want, are people just bypassing GPs? Is it too difficult to get a I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I have to say that I was shocked um, at, at that figure. The other figure that I was uh, a bit shocked at, well, the one I was delighted about was the minor injury units, that there are so few referrals there, and to me that tells me that they are doing an excellent job and they are freeing up resources in A&E. But NHS 24 referred 0 0.7 to the Southern General and yet 8.6 to St John's. Um, the, the GP referrals that I've mentioned, and Bruce Crawford did mention the 999 services, so I, I won't go into them, but the, the disparity uh, between different areas of the country, it's almost like different healthcare models. So my, just my final point, convener, uh, the self-referrals I've mentioned, the Belford and Fort William 82.5, and the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh 46. So about half. Now, I don't know. I, I'm finding, because we're only getting one part of the picture here, but if there was any further drilling down to be done, I think, as Bruce Crawford has said, it seems to be um, with, with, within here. I think there's, there's two um, things I'll highlight here, and Catherine may want to expand on it. First is that, um, as you say, the, the model of care varies a lot across Scotland. Um, partly that's entirely to be expected. Conditions in the islands, in remote parts of the Highland, are very different from those in the major cities in the central belt. Um, and what good care looks like is likely to vary as well. We have... Um, commented in part three of the report that we think there is still room for guidance from the government about different models of care and the way that they work, the relationship with minor injuries units, um, assessment units, admissions units and so on, um, is still very variable across Scotland. And that will be having an effect that you, you can't understand just through the national data. 
Secondly, as Catherine said in response to Mr Crawford's question, the data here we think is recorded inconsistently, especially in relation to 999 arrivals. Um, it's hard to um, envisage any A&E departments not having at least some 999 referrals, um, and we understand that for, for some hospitals, if the patient or family have dialed the ambulance themselves, that's called self-referral, and if the ambulance was called by a GP, it was a GP referral rather than a 999 referral. So so there are some, some inconsistencies in the data that we refer to that need to be better understood. Uh, as a Highlands and Islands MSP, I'm always quick to look at the islands and the remote areas. Uh, and although I use the Belford and Fort William, and uh, our highest mountain is close by, and obviously it's a very busy a &E department. But what I should have said is here, Myers and the Southern General are uh, 80 and 79.8%. So the difference between our two biggest cities in Scotland, we've got 46% self-referral in Edinburgh and 80% self-referral in Glasgow. So we can't bring in any rural or remote factors there. I think my question is really, are all parts of A&E working well together? I'm very impressed at the minor injury unit. I think that is a fantastic figure. 0 0.2 referrals. They are obviously dealing with what, there is, what needs to be done. Do we need more minor in injury units? Is there a... a you know, are there more problems in accident and emergency uh, in areas where there are less minor injury units? Uh, I don't know. I just think we need more information about these figures. Are we making best use of the ambulance service and the paramedics, which do a fabulous job and stop many people having to go to A&E? And I think that's the frustration I'm finding today, convener, that we're looking at one part of the service and really the the different pattern on how it works together throughout Scotland and to me the shocking figure that 19 A&E uh, 19 departments out of 31 have no referrals from a GP. Um, I just wonder the additional work that you mentioned to Bruce Crawford, will it drill down into these figures or is there not even a recommendation of best practice nationally that would improve these figures in the longer term? I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the solution to making sure that everybody who needs to go to A&E gets treated quickly and effectively isn't about A&E departments, it's about the whole system. And the data at the moment helps us pose some of those questions and answer some of them, but not all of them. And we'll be taking that a bit further in our own work, and the government's trying to do that through its unscheduled care action plan. You asked earlier about the recommendations that were made in the last report in 2010. One of the um, important ones, um, I think, that hasn't been fully uh, responded to is about providing that guidance on what models of care are most effective. Um, you can see in Exhibit 4 that the distribution of activity between A&E departments and my minor injury units, for example, varies a great deal across Scotland and not in ways that you can easily explain by geography or deprivation or anything else. Um, the question isn't just about minor injury units, but also admissions units, assessment units, the links with GPs and the ambulance service and NHS 24. And we think that um, getting those models right in each part of Scotland will go a long way towards relieving the pressure that we know exists. Just finally, there also seems to be a culture. Uh, I was quite shocked that in Glasgow, you know, self-referral is about 80 per cent, but 0 0.7 are through NHS 24. And yet you go to other parts of the country, St John's, 8.6. Is there a culture of people just turning up at the hospital rather than is NHS 24 perhaps being underutilised in some areas compared to others? Do you want to say anything about that? Um, we didn't look specifically at NHS 24, although we, we did, as Caroline has mentioned, the previous report look at referrals in um, there uh, from NHS 24 and again found that those were mostly appropriate referrals because patients then were actually quite um, sick and ended up being um, admitted to hospital. I just would like to pick up on the point of the GP referrals and GP referrals for admission. That's something, again, we highlight um, in the report huge inconsistencies in, in these two codes. This uh, GP referral for admission is a new code to the data mart um, over the last... I believe 18 months or so, um, but that's I think why we've made a recommendation around the Scottish Government um, sharing good practice on this process 
the way in which patients are referred into A&E. So, for example, some, some bypass the A&E department and some, you know, they go direct into a ward or into a specially, um, you know, acute receiving unit and some go th via A&E. So in order to understand the impact the current models have on performance, um, ISD Scotland is having discussions with boards around these, or, or filling out, completing these codes um, correctly because, I, for example, we know that Lothian, they record no... Um, they record high GP referral for admissions or the split between GP referrals for admissions and GP referrals wasn't quite right. And we, in our fact check with the board, we discovered that there, there needs to be a better split between these two boards, these two codes, sorry. So there is work ongoing with boards around this new code, GP referral for admissions. And we would expect to see um, would that come through the data mart over the next, um, the next few months. Okay. Colin Keir. Oh, sorry, Bruce. Yes, I'm it's interesting the point that Mary raised in regard to the Southern General, but again, this just I think emphasises the complexity of it. It will depend on what other services are available in the city. And because the Royal Hospital for Sick Children exists in Glasgow, and maybe more NHS 24 um, referrals being made there, and as a result, others, because the kids will be going there, obviously, a lot of them, and other, and other, uh, rather than other hospitals. So I, I think all that does is emphasise to me even more so the complexity of all this and the interrelationship. Right, there's a need to understand the whole system and a need to make sure we know which models of care do work well, that it's partly what um, services are available, it's partly how well the, the health um, board signpost people towards them so they know they exist and they know what's appropriate, and it's partly developing those further so that, as Catherine said, um, if it's more appropriate for GPs to be able to refer patients directly to a ward rather than going through A&E, there's a route for them to do that. All of this can really make a difference. Thanks, uh, convener. Um, thank you for bringing the report um, in front of us. I, th I found it very interesting, and given a number of the comments that have come from other sources, Jason Long, the chair of the College of Emergency Medicine, who's been quite supportive uh, of this, Ian Ritchie, the president of uh, the Royal College of Surgeons, who's pleased to see the ongoing uh, work that's been done. It seems to me that we are heading in the rough direction, the right direction anyway, after coming through a period that we were particularly affected by, say, norovirus and stuff like that. So it does appear to be um, going by the stuff that you've got in your report, plus what others are saying outside. Can I go just to the, the beds thing? I pulled the, just before I came out, the, the report that was actually produced in March by ISD. Um, which talks, it's, it's in relation to the quarter ending December 13 about beds. And it says the number of available staff beds in acute specialties was recorded as 16,223, as you pointed out, in the quarter ending December 2013. This is actually an increase of 1.1% from the 16,041 in December 12. So going by that, obviously it's not been taken into I don't think you've taken that into consideration in this report, have you? Um, what we quote in paragraph 40 is the shift between our baseline in 2008-9, the baseline from our last report, and the latest available figures when we were preparing the report, which was 2012-13. They're consistent with yours. We've got 16 to 30 for March 2013. Um, your figures sound as though it may have gone up um, or perhaps down very slightly up at, at, from, from there, but very close, 230 to 223. The publication date of that was the 25th of March. Uh, and your figure was 16,223? Uh, that's what it was, 16,223 yeah. in the quarter ending December 2013. Yeah. Well, that's, so seven, this, that's seven beds lower than the figure we've got yeah. for March 2013, um, but very close. Yeah, uh, it's an increase of 1.1. Just trying to yeah. say, going by what the professionals appear to be saying outside, coming from where we were, and uh, obviously seeing things such as, I know in the likes of uh, the Royal Infirmary, there's been a new ward opened up and I think there's obviously pressures there that come from the fact that the building was built too small. Um, and I think half the problems come from that in itself. But um, it's really just an acceptance of the fact that we appear to be heading in the right, the right direction. And I would associate myself with Bruce Crawford's comments about perhaps an in-depth um, uh, look at things from the committee responsible in the Parliament may be more appropriate as we head forward. 
Um, in terms of the overall direction of travel, um, we've been very clear in the report and all of our comments about it, um, that performance has deteriorated slightly since our last report in 2010, but that it improved during 2013, and we think that's a result of the Scottish Government's National and Scheduled Care Action Plan and the action being taken there. We're not raising a specific concern about bed numbers. Um, the data doesn't support that. But certainly the bed occupancy rates in acute medicine are at the level that starts to give clinicians cause for concern. Um, and I think there's a, a shared agreement that uh, taking this a step further to really understand the interplay of the different factors, both at a national level and more importantly locally, is the key to helping A&E departments really manage the pressures that they're facing which are real and reflect demographic change, the overall financial pressures um, and all of the other pressures that we're very familiar with. OK. OK. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. James Donnan. Thank you very much. I had a couple of questions that have already been asked, but I'd like to go back, unfortunately, for this, to this last 10 minutes thing. Can, uh, I, I wonder if any of the evidence shows that instead of it being that we're looking at these people in the last 10 minutes, as Catherine Young said earlier, uh, and, and Mary Scanlon suggested that maybe what we're doing was we're leaving the most complex to the end. Could it be possible that what's happening is that we're looking at the more complex people earlier, as, as was kind of suggested in your response, but because of the complexities of the, the situation, it's taken that period of time to make sure that we get appropriate beds for them? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. And First of all, I, d I don't think it's a surprise that there's a sort of peak of activity just before the four hours. I think that's what targets do quite understandably. We're all human and we'll do our best to hit it in those circumstances. We didn't find any evidence that that was being done inappropriately. What we have found, though, I think, through case studies like the Tayside one, is evidence that if you start your planning as early as possible within the four hours, you can smooth that peak back down. Um, so, uh, as Catherine said, for... Um, Nine Wells Hospital, they have about 4% of admissions from A&E in the last 10 minutes, and we think that's very clearly because they're identifying very early on which patients are likely to be admitted and start the process then of finding a bed for them. So they're not, they're not taking three hours to decide the patient needs to be admitted and then rushing for the last hour to find a bed. That's happening right the way through the four hours, which is better for everyone involved. The consensus that that's the best practice that others should be looking at. Hopefully that's what will happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, final um, question, Auditor General. You mentioned and others have mentioned um, the numbers of people presenting to accident and emergency and you know, taking it um, in the wider uh, context. You know, the, there is a lot of excellent work being done coping um, with, that, with that level of demand. Um, did you look at all about whether... Um, people were going to accident emergency either through self-referral or, uh, or pro I suppose predominantly through self-referral referral, instead of going to the GP out of our service? We've explored that as far as it's possible to do through the data. As I say, this is an update rather than the full audit that we've done in 2010 and we'll do again next year. What we know is that, um, as Catherine said, the, the, there's some evidence that people attending A&E are getting sicker, if I can put it in crude terms. They're in the higher um, flow categories, um, and there are fewer people with minor illness and injury attending. We know there are more older people attending, um, and they tend to be um, sicker and have more complex needs and are more likely to be admitted, both of which add to the pressure. Um, overall, A&E attendances in A&E departments, as opposed to uh, minor injury units, have fallen slightly, and attendances at minor injury units have gone up quite markedly since our last report, which suggests there's a move in the right direction. But you can see from various exhibits throughout the report that that's not consistent across the country. Catherine, yeah. that show uh, the demand on, on GP out of our services and, and what the trend has been? Um, we haven't used them here. Catherine, do you um, know what's available on that? We, we looked at that as part of the last A&E report. In fact, we carried out a patient survey to ask patients why, um, why they chose to attend A&E. And overall, we found that they felt that that was the most appropriate place to attend. So it's quite difficult to get behind reasons for attendance. Um, I think any... Um, any big increase in, in attendances in any particular A&E department, we would expect as part of the, the local unscheduled care action plans that boards would be looking at why 
why there's an increase and trying to get behind the reasons there. And um, we mentioned that as part of the signposting away from A&E into more appropriate services, that boards should be looking at what capacity there is in, in for example, GP out of hours or GP in hour services um, to ensure that there is capacity for, in other places for patients to go. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Willie? <coughs> Thanks very much again. Just for the, hopefully the benefit of the committee while the Auditor General was answering all the, the questions there, I've tried to work out what the shortfall actually is in meeting the target. It's about just over 24,000. That's to meet the target from 93 and a half presently up to 95. Um, I, would, I would hope and expect that, that that kind of level to meet the target isn't beyond us, given the range of discussions that we've had this morning at the, around the, the table, convener. Okay. We, we look forward to the, the next report with some anticipation. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution to the, the discussion. Um, item four on the agenda, we have a section 22 report. Um, the 2012-13 audit of <coughs> North Glasgow College uh, Governance and Financial Stewardship. Um, the Auditor General will give a briefing to the, the committee uh, along with Mark McPherson who is the senior manager Martin uh, Walker again um, assistant, di uh, assistant director uh, from Audit Scotland and Chris Brown who is a partner in Scotland Keith. just wait for uh, change over ok thank you what is the general? Thank you, convener. Um, this is a different sort of report from the one that you've been discussing earlier this morning. Um, this is a report produced under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Act 2000 on the annual accounts of North, Glasgow's Colle North Glasgow College for 2012-13. Um, might be useful to give the committee a bit of background to that first. On the 1st of November 2013, North Glasgow College merged with John Wheatley College and Stowe College to form the new Glasgow Kelvin College. In the merger period, which covered the two financial years 2011-12 and 2012-13, there was a reduction of around 27 staff employed by the three colleges, including a reduction of six in the number of senior staff. As part of that, the principal and vice principal of North Glasgow College accepted voluntary severance as part of the merger process. The committee will be aware that the, the early departures of public sector staff, particularly senior staff, has been a matter of ongoing public interest over the last few years. In May 2013, I produced a joint report with the Accounts Commission on managing early departures in the Scottish public sector. The aim of that report was to help public bodies improve their management and reporting of early severance schemes and to clearly set out the good practice principles. Although the report was published slightly before some of the severance arrangements described in this report were put in place, the principles have applied for much longer. And in the case of the college sector, the Scottish Funding Council's guidance on severance arrangements for senior staff has applied since January 2000. The Early Departures Report noted that early retirements and voluntary redundancies can be a useful way of avoiding the delays and the costs of compulsory redundancies and of quickly reducing staff numbers and costs. It also noted that significant amounts of public funds are spent on these arrangements um, and with a continuing need to reduce public spending, they're likely to remain an important management tool. Organisations therefore need to ensure that they follow the principles of good practice in how they design early, early departure schemes, how they ensure provide value for money and how they report publicly on the costs and savings. The auditor's opinion on the college's accounts for 2012 was not qualified. However, the auditor highlight, highlighted that the college did not provide sufficient evidence that the seven, severance arrangements for the two senior members of staff, the principal and vice principal, had been subject to the appropriate approval process. And the college also did not provide evidence that the costs had been assessed as providing value for money. In my report, I've highlighted that it's vital that senior managers and board members should be fully aware of the costs and benefits when making these decisions. Before approving any early departures, those charged with governance must ensure that they represent a good use of public money and a clear audit trail must be retained. In this case, the College did not retain the evidence necessary to provide assurance to the auditor that these factors have been fully considered. 
I've also highlighted two other issues in my report. The first is that the College did not include all of the costs relating to severance payments for all staff affected in the merger in its initial calculations. The additional costs were identified during the audit and contributed towards the College reporting a higher than anticipated deficit of £574,000 for the year. The second issue is that the Principal and Vice Principal were granted a period of garden leave. The Scottish Funding Council's guidance notes that there are few occasions where payment of salary in lieu of notice represents value for money, and that senior staff should normally be expected to work their notice period unless there are good reasons otherwise. As with the severance payments, there was a lack of evidence of the basis for the decision to grant garden leave. I understand that the board of the new Glasgow Kel Kelvin College is currently undertaking a full review of the audit reports to see what further action may be needed. It's worth noting more widely that a small number of other colleges have made similar errors in their calculations and a small number of others have provided payments in lieu of notice. However, the combination of issues at North Glasgow College contributed to my decision to, repair, to prepare my report in this case. As in previous years, I plan to publish an overview report on colleges covering the financial years 2012 and 2013-14 in due course. In the meantime, convener, we'll do our best to answer any questions the committee may have. Uh, thank you for that. Um, my rough calculation is that £1.3 million pounds was spent on um, severance payments. Um, and of that, just under 20%, 243,000 related to the principal and the vice principal. You know, this is a huge sum of money. It's a not quite accurate convener. If I can um, correct well, 243,000 related to payments to the principal yeah. and vice principal out of a total of 1.3 million. Yeah. 243,000 of the um, the uh, higher than anticipated deficit of 574,000 related to the principal and vice principal. Oh. I think that the total cost relating to their voluntary severances was 480,000. You're correct that 1.29 million was the total cost of so, voluntary severances so for over the So th over 30% then of the cost of severance payments related to the principal and vice principal. That's correct. It's worth saying that our concern in this case is not about the cost of the voluntary severances to those individuals. Um, they are, by their nature, more highly paid posts, I, and they I, tend I, to attract higher costs. I do understand costs. that, but yeah. it's still. Um, a very significant sum of yeah. money coming from college budgets which have been exceptionally hard pressed in, in recent years. You know, courses cut, reduced student numbers, uh, staff struggling to, to cope. Do we know how many people in that college um, left under, um, left with uh, severance payments? Um, we have a figure of 27 people, which I think re relates to all three of the colleges in the merger. Um, specifically for, for this specifically one. Specifically for North Glasgow, I think we would need to come back to you unless Martin's got those figures to hand. Um, no, I think we'd be better coming back with you. We know that there was some variations in the numbers. <clears throat> what we've got from the accounts is the number of severances and the number of people at positions. Some people left, some people came into post, so it'd be probably better for accuracy if we were to come back with you, uh, to you with those numbers. You know, th th these are huge costs associated with a, a process that many in the college sector um, thought was, was pointless. But, you know, we've got it and we're moving on and the colleges are moving on, are moving on and many um, are coping well. But wh what is worrying um, is paragraph 15 in, in, in your conclusions. Um, there was a, a lack of transparency around the process of agreeing the severance arrangements. The college did not retain the evidence needed to provide assurance that the arrangements were subject to appropriate scrutiny and approval. Um, and as a result, it's unclear whether those charged with governance considered that the associated costs would provide value for money. Now, when we're talking about huge sums of money, like 1.3 million almost, and we have people who are charged with that responsibility, and you're saying that it's not evident that they have considered whether there would be value for money, that they haven't retained the, the evidence. You know, that, that is it's, it's a serious charge which is, is being made. 
Um, are you aware whether any of the people associated with these decisions are still in positions of responsibility in relation to the new college? Our understanding is that they're not, that they've moved on through the merger process and the formation of the new Glasgow Kelvin College. Um, as I say, we understand that the board of the new college is reviewing both my report and the auditor's report to look at any action that may be required, um, but that's our understanding at the moment. Okay, thank you. Mary Scanlon? Um, when I read this, actually, <laughs> it's sort of more serious than many of the reports that uh, tend to, to come to us. Um, when I looked that the, the, the guidance had been ignored, the board of management had not been fully consulted, the, like the SFC guidance has been ignored, there seems to be uh, there's a lack of clear and comprehensive documentation, there's a lack of accountability and no details provided in any minutes. So, A, uh, my concern is, who is accountable? Will further investigation take place, despite, uh, I think I understand from the convener's question, that those who made this decision are no longer employed by the colleges. Nonetheless, what's happened here Will it just be brushed under the carpet and ignored? What further action will be taken? And I think what I'm asking, because I'm pretty new to this, was anything that was done illegal? Um, I hesitate to use the word fraudulent, you know. What, what concerns are you raising here today? Because I would hope that we never again see a paper like this in front of us. Um, how can we be sure as an audit committee that 1.3 million will be accounted for and that those who took this action will be held to account, whether that's through the courts or through any other process? The reason why I've laid this report before you today is because I share that concern. We've reported in a number of cases that, um, first of all, voluntary severance arrangements can be an important and indeed a necessary way of managing a merger process of reducing costs. There's nothing wrong with them per se, but the fact that they can result in payments being made to individuals either directly or into their pension funds um, means that the way in which those decisions are made is very important. In this case, as I said in, in response to a question from the convener, we have no indication that the amounts um, that were incurred in relation to any of these severance payments, including those of the principal and vice principal, were calculated wrongly or that they were illegal or fraudulent in any way. That's not why the report's here. It's because I believe that where public money is involved, it's really important that there is a fair and open and transparent process to make sure the decisions are made properly, that they represent value for money, and that they're proper properly scrutinised and challenged by those who've got governance responsibilities. I'll ask Chris if he can talk through um, his experience of auditing um, this expenditure and the um, process that the new college is going through to um, investigate this, if I may. That although it, it is not a fair, open and transparent process, but because there is a lack of evidence, surely that does not mean it's acceptable. And, I can only agree with you, Mrs. Scanlon. That's why this report is here. Yeah. Um, it would be an easy response for any audited body to say it's absolutely fine, but we've got no evidence. For us, the evidence is, is, a, is a central part of being able to demonstrate that good governance has been applied, that this was a fair decision, and that it was properly taken. So because you do not have the evidence, would you be recommending further investigation, perhaps by the police? Let me, talk Chris through okay. the Let me ask Chris to talk you through the audit work that's been done. Chris is a partner with Scott Moncrief, who carry out the annual audits of the college, and he's very close to this. I'll then pick up any outstanding questions from there. Okay. Yes, as, as the Auditor General says, um, we have no evidence of fraud, no evidence of any illegality. In fact, the college, we have evidence that the, uh, the College Remuneration Committee took uh, legal advice um, before they made the decisions that they made in terms of severance. Um, what we can't see is just the, the openness and transparency that you, you talk about. Um, so when, when, we're, when we're doing the audit, 
uh, one of the key aspects of our audit is to look at governance arrangements in our colleges. Um, and you know, we are aware that the public and yourselves expect very high standards in terms of governance of public bodies, so look at that quite carefully. Um, and in this area, the governance, the guidance for governance is quite clear. It's the Funding Council's guidance on uh, severance arrangements. Um, and that guidance, as I say, is, is, is very clear about the processes that colleges should go through when they are evaluating a voluntary severance or um, any kind of severance arrangement, um, particularly for senior staff. Uh, the process that they should go through should be very open and transparent. There should be clear rationale behind the decisions that they're, that they're making. Uh, there should be a business case developed. We would expect that business ca case to consider various options, because this was not the only option that the college could have taken. Um, to evaluate those options and to reach a conclusion on, on those and to document that whole process and retain the documentation for that process so that um, at a later point people can scrutinise that and challenge the rationale for the decision. The problem we've got here is we don't know the rationale for the decision because it wasn't properly documented. So there, there's a lack of accountability, there's a lack of openness, there's a lack of ability for you to, to scrutinise and challenge those decisions. And that's the that's, that's the key issue that we're raising here. It's, it's not actually that we found any evidence no, I, of fraud or illegality or even poor value for money. It may well have been good value for money. This arrangement is just that it's not clear, and it's not clear that the college went through the right process in making that decision. I appreciate that, but surely it cannot be acceptable in modern Scotland that 1.3 million can, of public funds can be dispersed to a hand, two or three individuals and that there's no audit trail. So my question, in order that fingers are not pointed at anyone, <laughs> illegally or otherwise, is what should be done in order to get this evidence? Uh, you know, I, we, we have had a case before, I think it was the National Libraries, that, uh, under the previous Auditor General, that did, uh, did lead to a police investigation. Um, and detainment, in fact. You know, is there a case here where we have nothing? That cannot be acceptable to people like yourself. It's not acceptable to me. I can't speak for my other colleagues. So where do we go from here? We can't just say there's no evidence, so we'll just move on. Do you, is it, in these cases, can, what further action can you recommend beyond what you've put in front of us today? My main power and responsibility is to report to the Parliament. And I think that there's a question for the committee about what further action you may wish to take um, to hold people to account for um, this failure of governance. The other route that we are pursuing is to stay close to the action which the new college has taken to investigate um, what happened during the merger process, um, to look at what action, if any, they think is required, and to assess whether that is appropriate and adequate. Um, so we will stay close to that through the audit process, through the audit of the new college. Um, but I do think it's important for me to be clear that my powers are those of reporting. Uh, sorry, the investigation by the new college, the new merged college, will it give us the answers that we're looking for today? Will you come back to us with another paper to say we now have the evidence and we are satisfied and we can clear these accounts? I think what I can say at this stage is that it's a very positive step that the, the new college board, the new principal, um, is taking the, these reports seriously. My report and uh, Scott Moncrief's report as the auditor. It's too soon for me to make any assessment of how um, effective their investigation is, but certainly will follow up any issues. And I think Martin may want to add to that. Yeah, ju just to say um, <clears throat> that um, it was Monday of this week that the new board of Glasgow Kelvin um, took the report from the new principal um, on this issue. So the first thing there is around transparency in that the principal was keen to make the board aware of the report of the issues. My understanding of, of where that meeting went is that the uh, board of the new college um, agreed that it should be remitted to the audit committee of the new college and it will be for them to determine what the next steps are in terms of further investigation work. I think particularly I understand from my discussions with the new principal that the, <clears throat> the board and he are both very keen on ensuring that robust governance arrangements are in place for the new college 
what I'm not sure about as we, we sit here today is the extent to which there is the backward investigation as well as making sure things are right going forward. Um, so as the Auditor General has said, that's something that we'll keep a close eye on uh, through the appointed auditor and um, with, the, with the new college. Just before I bring Tavi Scott in, can I get some clarification on the, the issue of remedy? Um, Mr Brown has said that he hasn't seen any evidence of um, fraud or illegality uh, and therefore it's unlikely that, that that route could be pursued. But if boards of colleges, and this is about maybe not, not a warning, but s s giving information to the, the boards of the new colleges and indeed any other public agency about what is expected of them, that they are not there simply to rubber stamp um, the wishes of the principals or indeed you know, anyone else in senior management, they have a, a legal uh, and a moral duty to, to look after the best interests of, of the organisation. Is there a civil remedy if it's found that someone has acted um, without due diligence, maybe not illegally, but has failed to live up to the standards that, that, that are expected? Is there a civil remedy <coughs> that the money can be recovered, not from the recipients, because they've entered into a, a legal um, arrangement, but from those who made the decision to disperse the, the funds in the first place? aware of a, a civil remedy which exists in relation to these sorts of decisions unless it can be shown that the circumstances were such that, that there is some um, liability there. That's very unusual in audit terms. Um, we will be staying in close contact with the Scottish Funding Council about the new guidance which applies to colleges um, and we will be um, thinking through when we see the results of the, the college's own investigation what that throws up about personal um, culpability, but liability is a difficult question in these cases. It, it would be worrying if you find that the boards of, of public bodies act technically within the law, but act in a cavalier way that outrages um, you know, the, the general public, that they make decisions about um, extravagant use of public resources, and then we find that not only is there, because nothing illegal was done, there is no civil remedy. Basically, they can do as they wish without any worry. Now, that, that, would, that would be of concern if there was no comeback to those who were um, foolishly to using public resources. I want to be very clear that I'm talking hypothetically here, not about this specific case, but the closest parallel that I'm aware of is where an individual has been found um, wanting through a disciplinary process and a penalty has then been imposed in relation to um, access to their pension rights in future. We've seen that in a number of public services in the most egregious cases, but um, in general, it's difficult to show that personal liability and instead the route is through um, the audit report and then the committees holding to account of the individuals responsible um, for the action that they took or failed to take. It looks as though potentially, we'll, we'll see what happens eventually, but potentially uh, there is no way of holding people to account. You know, they've moved on, the deed's been done. Tavi Scott? Convener, can I just ask Chris Brown, uh, trying to establish a couple of facts here. I think, Mr Brown, you mentioned the remuneration committee. Um, did, did they make the decision on the severance of these, of these people? Well, this, this is the key issue that we have, that we, we can't see sufficient evidence that they did make the decision. Paperwork. There's, there's no paperwork. Uh, there's a minute, a very brief minute, it's about a page and a half, of a meeting that was held on the 3rd of June, remuneration committee meeting. Um, most of that meeting was taken up, it, it appears in the minute, with discussion about the new principal's salary. But there is some evidence that there was some discussion about the severance of the, the outgoing principal and vice principal. Um, but there's no evidence that you know, the full details of the packages that were provided to those individuals were discussed or were available to the committee at that point. Okay, and, and, but that minute then went to the board for, for approval as the no. government? No. So, so that's one of the other big issues that we've raised. Is okay, that, that, I saw it. That minute doesn't appear to have gone to the board. How many people were on this remuneration committee? Can we name them? 
Um, Presumably that's a matter of record. We, yes, yeah. we could. We could, we could find out the names. But as far as you're aware, they were the people who took the decision. The only documentation we have is that committee, the, the, however many people were on that committee, took yeah. the decision in relation to the severance packages for these two individuals. Yeah, well, as I say, the, po the point we're making is that it's, we don't have the evidence that actually they did make the decision. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. It, we, because we just can't, we can't see no. you know, the, 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 the costs that actually were, were incurred by the college we can't see evidence that those costs were presented to that remuneration committee and that they approved that expenditure. We, that's, the, that's the issue that we're raising. We can't see that. And we, we can't see that that was then presented to the board. Yeah. So you think it was an oral discussion rather than any written... Because, because they could not give you any written evidence at all. It was just a, it was a, an oral discussion without any... It may well have been an oral but discussion. You, yeah, we, do, we don't But you presumably interviewed them. So presumably you asked them... As it, I don't mean to be kind of aggressive about this, but yeah. you presumably said directly to them, what did you do? How did you come to this conclusion? So, so one of the issues that we have with this situation is that um, because the college finished on the 31st of October, yeah. well, effectively, the, the new college started on the 1st of November, the board members of the, pre the outgoing college, they finished on the, on the 31st of October. Some of them continued into the new college, um, but the, the key individuals, really, the chair of the remuneration committee, who was the chair of the board of the old college, um, he finished on the 31st of October, which was midway through our audit. So actually, I did speak to the chair of the, uh, the board. He was very keen to talk to me and to give me as much evidence as he, as he had about the rationale for the decision. But he couldn't give me evidence that that had been presented to the remuneration committee. Um, and he couldn't give, provide evidence that the whole board had seen that evidence and discussed it and approved it. Um, and by that time, it was too late because it, it all left. The evidence, could he say whether it did or not, even if he could, you know, as it were, face-to-face yes. -face or over the yes. telephone, tell you he'd we, we, done yes, that? Yes, he did. And he did, yeah. he did okay. confirm that. Right, yes. OK. And he has confirmed that in writing, in fact, okay. to other members of the remuneration committee. Yes, yes. Um, so we understand that there was, there was some communication between members of the uh, remuneration committee regarding the severance arrangements. Telephone calls or face-to-face -face discussions rather than anything in writing. There's no email trail or anything like that. There, there are some, there are some letters. Yes. Um, we haven't seen the letters from the remuneration committee to the chairman of the board, but we have seen a letter from the chairman of the board back to the remuneration committee members, yes. confirming to them that the proper process was followed. Yeah. So yes, he's he, he's very clear yes. that the, cr okay. the proper process okay. was followed. Okay. It's just that we can't. All we have is. <laughs> Right. Okay. No, that's very helpful. I apologise for kind of pursuing this process point. The other point, just on Kavina's question about, or the Kavina's very f correct point about the fact that two individuals have gone, they presumably have a legal agreement that they were, that they are party to in terms of the, in terms of what they've received. But that legal agreement must be a legal agreement between them as individuals and the previous board. So some lawyer, I mean, I don't mean some lawyer in a pejorative sense, our lawyer must have drawn that up on their behalf under instruction. And an accountant must have, as it were, signed an electronic check. So there must be something behind all that. Or was it simple? Or is all you found that actually a lawyer was orally told, draft up some agreement to go, a letter to go to said individuals saying we will pay you X, and the accountant was then told to just rash it on that basis to, as it were, sign the, the check? You'll, you'll I'm probably simplifying this enormously, no, but. Uh, uh, You'll understand, I'm sure, that the basis of any audit has to be the financial statements or the audit trail or the minutes or the business case that's been drawn up. In this case, as Chris has said, um, the former chair of the board has told us that due process was followed and has, we, we haven't seen evidence to support that assertion, which is why we're bringing the report to you today. Um, I need to stress again, we don't have any indication that the amounts the, the costs incurred in this were improper, but we aren't able to satisfy ourselves that the decisions were properly taken and that they represent value for money for the public purse. Okay, uh, and I'll stop at this, but it, so the crux of this for us in terms of how we analyse what happened, and appreciate your experts, and we're a committee, and therefore by definition not experts, is the, ch the person who was the previous chair of that board who seems to have been sure that the proper processes were followed but can't provide or couldn't provide you with any correct or any evidence as to how that process was followed. More generally, those charged with governance, the board has a, yeah. a specific oh, indeed. No, indeed. responsibility yeah. um, to, yeah. to carry okay. out. Thank you. That's Before all. I bring Bruce Croft in, Mr Brown, can I clarify, you, you said that um, there was no evidence. Do we actually know who took the decision to make these payments? Well, we understand, we understand from 
speaking to the chair of the board, the remuneration committee took the decision. That's, that's our understanding. But the point we're making is we don't have the evidence from a minute of the remuneration committee and supporting papers that, they, that actually supports that assertion. So, if a college or a, a remuneration committee of a college <coughs> decides to make um, a payment and there is no evidence that they were authorised to do so, does that not then leave them liable yeah. for any payment that, that was made? You know, on whose authority was the payment made if there is no evidence to justify the making of that payment? Yeah. That's one of the matters that we hope the new college's investigation will explore. You would expect any payment, um, as Mr Scott um, suggested, to be properly supported by proper authorisation. Um, the chair of the board has told the auditor that the decision was properly taken. We would expect the new college board to be investigating thoroughly what happened and who is responsible, whether they're a member of the staff or the board of the new college, or whether they left in October last year, as Chris has described. Ms Crawford. Yeah. At the very least, I think you can say we've got a serious breakdown of governance. Um, people, the general public, will expect us to make sure that we follow the public pound and get that value for money and unearth as much as we possibly can. I recognise this investigation is going on with the college. When do we expect that to be completed? Because I think that might well, might well drive convener what we decide to do as a committee next in terms of any action we would want to take because um, it will depend on how in-depth that is able to be and what information it can provide us with. Martin, can you add to that? Yeah, so um, we need to check um, with the college um, around the remit and the timescales in terms of how it's going to consider um, these issues. As I say, I know that on Monday... Um, the new board considered the report and made the decision to refer it to its audit committee. I think an important thing will be the next stage, which is understanding when it will be considered by the audit committee, what action the audit committee turn, uh, plans to take in terms of any investigation and looking at the governance arrangements for the new college to ensure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Um, so when, when we know what the plan timescales are for that and the remit of that, that obviously puts us in a much better position to be able to sort of see how robust that will be and, and what that may find in due course. Uh, Mr Martin Walker, it might, it might be appropriate, obviously, for yourselves to be completing that exercise and understand that. Do you think it might also be appropriate for this committee ourselves to be writing to the new college asking them the same point? What's the time scale they expect this to be involved in? And can, uh, uh, can they tell us? And when do they expect the recommendations that flow from that to be um, in the public domain so that we could take a decision about what we do with it at that stage? Because people will expect us to take this to the nth degree. Yeah, you can consider that for We'll do that then. The agenda. Okay. Um, Ken McIntosh. Uh, just to uh, clarify, with the Auditor General, um, would the money from, for these PFs be taken out of the college merger, the additional funds that are provided for merging Scotland's colleges? Um, I don't think it certainly wouldn't be funded directly in that way. Um, our understanding is that the impact of the total costs of the voluntary severances um, are met by the college. There was a small grant available to colleges for um, some parts of voluntary severance funding, um, and uh, the higher than expected deficit will then fall to be met from the new college's own funds. Um, we haven't seen the full impact of that yet. We'll need to move into the new financial year to see the way in which that works. But as the convener suggested earlier, it is money which is being met from the college's overall budget, which is intended primarily, obviously, for providing education to lifelong learners. As I said, we're not suggesting, we have no evidence to suggest that the money wasn't um, appropriately calculated. Our concern is that we don't have the evidence to suggest that it was and was properly decided. Is there a threshold above which any such payments are referred to ministers or to the funding council? I don't think that there is. Colleagues will keep me straight. No. Would, and would such an agreement contain a, 
a, a compromise agreement or, or a gagging clause of any kind? As we've reported to the committee before, most voluntary severance arrangements are supported by a settlement agreement. Um, those should not include um, gagging clauses or confidentiality clauses other than around the, the specific circumstances of the individuals. And they certainly shouldn't be used as a means of um, withholding the cost of the public purse um, involved in the individual arrangements. Um, Chris may know more about the circumstances in this case, but it would be very common for a settlement agreement to be in place in cases like this. Mm. Yes, so there were compromise agreements, yes, with, the, with the, the senior staff who left, but we don't have any evidence that they were unduly restrictive compromise agreements in terms of containing gagging clauses. Well, I'm not right in thinking that uh, all compromise agreements have to be referred to ministers now. I think that's right in relation to the NHS. I, I don't know if it's, it's correct more widely at this stage. I don't want to mislead the committee by suggesting that. Martin, can you help on that yeah, point? And certainly, um, as I understand it, the process, the, indeed, it, it was on the back of, well, connected to, it's like purely on the back of, but connected to the, the publication of our report last year around managing early departures, where the committee has been in correspondence with the Scottish Government around particularly the issue of settlement agreements, compromise agreements, whatever you wish to call them. Um, and I know that there was a process underway there um, consulting on what the new arrangements will be, which I think believe take effect from this current financial year. And there is an expectation in there that there will be consultation with Scottish Government around um, cases where settlement agreements are, are put in place. Um, I understand that the objective of that is to try and ensure that there was much more transparency because I believe it was the, the committee themselves, yourselves, that were asking the question about how many, where are they happening, all those kinds of things. At that point in time, the, the, the government's position, there's, there wasn't a centrally held note of all of those. Um, and I think one of the things around the new arrangements is to try and resolve that, that situation so there is you know, more visibility about those things. But that new regime, you're absolutely right, that's exactly what's happened, but the new regime has not yet been implemented, is that right? Um, I think the intention was to get that in place for the current financial year, but we need to check on the detail of that. I know that there was some um, consultation going on about that, so we need to get back to you on that. I think the other point to mention as well uh, is that the, um, since colleges became part of the public sector on the 1st of April, they, they are now subject to the, the guidance in the Scottish Public Finance Manual, which is the guidance that's being, that Martin referred to that's being updated. But at the point in time we're talking about here in, in, in November, they weren't part of the public sector, so the SPFM guidance didn't apply to them at that point. James Thornton. Thank you, Convener. Uh, you said that you haven't seen anything that, that suggests that the proper processes were put in place. The, in here, you talk about evidence of uh, legal advice given to the committee. I take it that's a remuneration committee that was meant to have received that evidence? Uh, yes, that, yes was, but that was legal advice that was provided to the chair of the remuneration committee, yes. Yeah, but you, you, is there nothing to suggest that they ever saw, the rest of the committee ever saw it or discussed it? The, the, there is something to suggest that. The chair of the remuneration committee told me that the remuneration com committee did see that evidence. But in the minute? But we just can't see the evidence from the minute or from any papers that we were given from the remuneration committee that, you know, that showed that. Oh, it's very surprising. I was on a remuneration committee and you know, everything just goes to the board for final decision after, after we make our, yeah. uh, our suggestions. The, okay, the, the, the letter from the chair that, that you said showed in response to a letter from the remuneration committee that you can't see. Was there much detail in that, or was it a sort of one-liner? Well, there was a fair bit of detail in it. The, yeah. Did it suggest that there had been a process, that there had been, you know, the, some discussions at the, the, the committee? Yes, it did. It, did. it suggested, it actually set out um, the process that the, the chair of the, the remuneration committee, the chair of the board, uh, it's the same person, um, uh, believed had taken place. So that was him providing assurance to the remuneration committee members about the process, which he's des he described to us actually took place. So, and, and yes, the letter is quite detailed in terms of a number of bullet points about that process. The, the, the fact that there had to be a letter to the remuneration committee describing to that committee the process that they had followed in itself, I think, um, in, in our view, that, that supported 
our view that actually the process wasn't as transparent and open as it should have been in the first place. So it wasn't really. You, you don't see it as being a response to a letter from them that's, that, that was that he was he was uh, responding to bullet points or whatever. It was more like he was laying out about this is what we did. Um, I think so, but because I've not seen the original letter, I can't say that for certain. But I think that would probably be something that the uh, although I don't want to. Um, speculate on what the board and the audit committee will want to investigate and what to look at, but I would imagine that would be one of the things they want to have a look at. The, the, the last thing I'd like to ask is, you said earlier on, you'd, uh, correct me if I'm wrong about the, the language you used, but that the payoff itself wasn't unusual. Would that be, would that be fair? Um, we, we've reported on several occasions in the past that voluntary severance payments can be a necessary way of reshaping public services. And obviously the sort of situation where you're merging three colleges into one, you have three principals and three vice principals, is the sort of um, situation where you might expect voluntary severance to be uh, the right approach to getting a new management team in place. But because of the sensitivity um, of payments being made to individuals or from which they benefit, that's, all, that's the reason why we think it's so important to have proper governance and transparency around it. it, so, it alongside the lack of transparency, the only other issue you have then is the one about garden leave, which you thought was pretty unusual. Would that be right? Um, Yes, I mean, I think the governance concern is, is the main one. Um, as the convener has said, um, £1.3 million uh, pounds in total, about 480000 relating to these two individuals, were cost to the college budget, um, and it's important the college can demonstrate that was done properly. We also do mention um, some errors made in the initial calculations by the college for all of the voluntary severances that they agreed, and then the question of um, garden leave or payment in lieu of notice for the two individuals. Sort of I'll just follow that then. Do we have a, any evidence that shows how they worked out the figures in the first place that get them wrong, or is that something else that's missing? The, 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 there isn't a business case, as Chris has said, which says um, here are the costs that would be incurred, here are the benefits that we think we would get, and here's why we think it's value for money. And we would expect that as an absolute basic in any voluntary severance decision. Hey, thanks very much. So, Mr. Brown, can I uh, I'll bring Colin in a minute? Can I just clarify? Did, did you say that the chair of the board was also the chair of the remuneration committee? That's right. Perhaps that's maybe something that, that we need to look at, whether there should be um, some kind of uh, split in, in responsibilities, but we can do that later. Sorry, Colin Kerr. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's really kind of basic one for someone who's not a qualified accountant, whatever, but I noticed that in the report um, you see, it says that the auditor gives an unqualified opinion on the college's accounts. Well, given the questions I've been asked by two, three, four of the members um, here just now, uh, uh, Mr Dornan's particularly about the process aspect of chairmanship and all these sort of things, is that something that you, you could put a, a qualified um, account or is it just the fact you feel you've been able to identify the money? It's just it's the process is controversial as to how that money has been handled? Yes, yes. so the, the accounts do fairly reflect all of the costs of the severance arrangements. And um, the payments in themselves um, are not... Um, on the face of it, irregular payments, because they are the kind of normal payment that you might expect to see in a voluntary severance. The payments were in relation to you know, voluntary severance payment, which is a contractual payment, um, in addition to um, an enhancement of pension, which is um, not necessarily contractual, and uh, costs in relation to um, gardening leave. So a period of time, six months, where uh, the individuals weren't actually working for the college, but they were getting paid. So, um, so all of those costs are, you know, normal costs that we might expect to see in a VS uh, situation. And I'm actually, we, we have seen in other colleges, we've seen other colleges make very similar kinds of arrangements um, in this, situ this kind of situation. But what's happened there is that they've been very clear about making sure they documented the rationale for those, for the decisions that they took. Um, in terms of uh, demonstrating that those costs were actually value for money. The problem we've got here is it's, it's purely a value for money and governance process issue. Uh, yeah, because I, mean, I was just a bit unclear about at what point does the unusual, compared with the usual, end up 
producing a qualified set of accounts as it's an unqualified um, set. Yes, yes. So, so if the costs hadn't been reflected in the accounts at all, for example, then that would have been a qualified okay. an issue for qualification. Yeah, thank you. The final question. Um, are you, your comments, uh, Auditor General, about um, gardening leave, uh, do you have any indication that prior to the, the mergers and creation of the new colleges, uh, how many senior staff were on gardening leave and for how long by college? Not at the moment. Um, one of the things that the team are currently doing is reviewing the um, accounts and the audit reports for all of the outgoing colleges. Um, in some cases, we're going back and asking further questions of the auditors, uh, either because an issue isn't clear on the face of the accounts or because we'd like to know more about the circumstances. Um, if a particular issue arises at a college, I'll report on that separately. Otherwise, I'd expect to sweep that up as part of my next report on the college sector um, as part of our update on the progress of reform. It, it would be interesting to see that because I'm aware um, of concerns raised, um, for example, uh, the one at the top of my head, James Watt College in, in Inverclyde, there could be others, of, of where senior management were, in, were on extended gardening leave. Um, and it would be interesting just to see the extent of that and whether um, colleges were using substantial amounts of uh, public money to, to ease their way through a change process. So, you know, any information you could get would be helpful on it. So, thank you very much. Um, the final letter that, the, that we got as a committee in, in November 2013 just talks about, for, it's from the SFC about guidance, and it says that um, the SFC um, said it's a good relation. We expect colleges internal auditors to consider any risks presented by processes uh, and advising SFC if they do not conform to our guidance. Uh, and prior to any payment, they, they expect them to be notified um, of any uh, overall severance costs to provide information on the number of staff and associated costs before making any payment towards such costs. So, is there, was the SFC asked? Was, was the SFC told about this? In this case, they said, by the way, we have received no such advice. This is November 2013. So, it might be too close to I this think case, there's a but, timing issue anyway. Yeah. As Chris says, these were um, finishing in 31st October. Um, I also think that the word you use then was to be notified rather than for the SFC to approve them, um, so that there is um, a, a question about the process that was required. But our starting point is that the, the Funding Council's guidance dating back to the year 2000 was absolutely clear about what good governance looks like in these instances, um, and this uh, process didn't meet that guidance by some way. Okay, thank you, um, Auditor General, for uh, and, and your colleagues for their evidence. Um, before I, I move on to the next item, can I note for the record that apologies had been received from Colin Beatty and that David Torrance um, has been attending as his substitute. I apologise for not putting that on record earlier on. Um, we will now move in to private session and take a break for a few minutes. <laughs>